Hello and welcome to the photography show Spring Shoots. I'm Angela Nicholson. I'm one of the founders of Camera Jabber, which is a website for photographers with reviews, news, tips and techniques. And I'm the founder of She Clicks, which is a network or a community for female photographers. And I'm delighted to be hosting this session today, which is all about the Fujifilm X series. And I'm joined by a collection of great guys from uh, Fujifilm UK. Hi, how are you all? Very well, thanks, Ange. How are you? Hello. Pretty good, thanks. So we've got uh, we've got Andreas, and who else we've got? We've got Carl, and we've got James. Yeah. Good to see you all Hello. here. Now I understand you've got a presentation to start off with. I was going to say presentation is is a very very strong description <laughs> of what I've got. Um, it, it was just uh, some some visual aids to help us. Uh, explain a bit about the range of X series and GFX um, just in case we were short of um, questions to be perfectly honest. So um, what we wanted to do was explain a bit about the X series in general. We've been going for about 10 years, this system, and we utilize an APS-C size sensor. And that the reason for that is because we feel it's the best combination of size, portability, um, image quality, and, and price to and so like by keeping it um keeping the system around the APS-C sensor we're able to make sure that the cameras don't get too big the lenses don't get too big things like that and ultimately the reason for going mirrorless versus DSLR is normally to save some weight um and if possible save some money so our range is split out into two very definitive groupings um how I like to call them we've got what we what we've got SLR style cameras so traditional um, central viewfinder position, um, dials on the top, um, and so like a, a grip on the right hand side, and and what have you. So they so look very very traditional. And then X Pro Three, XC Four, and X One Hundred V are what we would call um, rangefinder style cameras. So where the viewfinder is in the top left hand corner, if you're looking at the camera from the back, and um, we've got hybrid viewfinders which have both optical and electronic elements. Um, and then we've got so like just just the pure electronic. The good thing about the Fujifilm system is that actually the image quality doesn't change as you move up the range on X-Series. So the base sensor and processor is actually exactly the same now on everything from the flagship X-T4 all the way down to something like the X-T30 or X-C4. What you are getting are other features and functionality um, that might assist your photography in terms of weatherproofing, dual card slots, um, fully articulating screens, in-body image stabilization, all those things that actually just start adding up and make make the camera a bit more versatile, but, but help you um, decide which one's the right for you. We don't believe that image quality should be the deciding factor when it comes to the X series. So um, we've got a range, seven cameras, very, very concise range. And, and we, we've got something for everyone, we feel, be it your, your hybrid video and still shooter, um, something like the X-T4 would be ideal. Um, your X-T3, so like more designed at the sort of like a, a pure photographer and your X-S10, which again um, breaks that mold in terms of the this great for video and stills with in-body stabilization, very angle screen. And your X-T30, ideally designed for that traditional photographer trying to get into the, to the system. And then as we said earlier, rangefinder style camera, so X-Pro3, um, hybrid optical and electronic viewfinder, um, very, very um niche specialist but but also for pretty much for the photography purists then your xc4 that we we recently just launched um so so much much smaller much more compact and then your x100v which is probably it, it x100 series is actually where where the system all kicked off um all those years ago so so we've got we believe something for everyone um be them just starting out or more advanced users as well well, uh, so, Andreas, if I could interrupt you for a second, because we've got you've just got to a point which is a really pertinent question. Because someone here is saying that they have a Canon 5D Mark III and they would yeah. like to switch to Fuji. Which camera would you recommend for someone at that quite quite high level DSLR? So, the so my gut feeling automatically goes to something like the XT3 in terms of the um, classic controls. Um, the three-way tilt screen, the um, weather-resistant body, the two SD card slots, 
Um, and that would be the, the camera that would instinctively think to yourself, actually, we've had a lot of Canon 5D, Nikon D800 series sort of customers come over to the system. And that's sort of like the, the camera that they would look at. Now, if that customer is also thinking, actually, I want to be able to shoot a bit of video, um, then something like the X-T4 would probably be a better bet because it has the in-body image stabilization. So, so it's very, very useful for video as well. So X-T3, X-T4 is where, where we pitch at. But the good thing about um, us in the UK is we, we've got, um, utilizing the, the work of our, our friends at Hire a Camera, we're able to offer anyone a free 48 hour loan so they can check for themselves without even needing to to um, buy something so that they can be sure of what what's the right for them. That's a fantastic service as well, because the uh, the delivery is included, isn't it? So you get 48 yeah, hours so with the camera. Exactly. So for, free for 48 hours. So they, they don't pay anything for delivery. They don't pay anything for the collection as well. Um, Fujifilm-loan.com. Um, and anyone thinking about switching to Fujifilm can literally borrow what they like, try it out, no risk, no obligation, and then it just gets collected from them as well. Fantastic. I guess the risk is that you might end up wanting to spend a lot of money with you guys, though. <laughs> is that really a risk? I mean, ultimately... <laughs> yes. Okay. okay. So... Um, what the, the next thing that I wanted to talk about was obviously lenses, because obviously the, the what, what you get taught in photography all those years, what I got taught in photography all those years ago was, was you're only as good as the lens you've got in front of your camera. And it's very, very important to have a versatile wide range of native lenses to make the most of, of those uh, cameras and, and sensors. So we feel that we've got pretty much um, every range, every, every we've got most lenses to suit every style of photography, be it small compact primes for, for street photographers, be it sort of like the, the large, more professional primes for, for your wedding photographers, the versatile zoom lenses, um, the, the, the F 2.8, so like all the way through zoom lenses that you'd expect. The sort of like more travel zoom. So, so that's 16 to 80 and then 70 to 300. So those really super versatile zoom lenses. And also we've even got, um, going, looking at our heritage and it's sort of like the movie field, we've got the, uh, cine lenses as well. So we've got over 35 native lenses for, for the range. And, and that just keeps going in our commitment to, um, both updating and sort of like bringing out new lenses continues throughout the year. So the, the system it's it's important it's it's an integral part of the lens and the, and the camera it's not just about bringing out more and more camera bodies you need to be supporting the lenses uh, as well so we've got a wide wide range of lenses available yeah i mean that that is quite an array of, of lenses available to people and we have a question here from someone uh, who bought himself an xt30 as a retirement present very nice. And it was bundled with an 18 to 55 and a 55 to 200. And they're both great lenses, he says, but he wants to photograph fast moving, fast moving sport. And he's asking if there's a 70 to 200 sort of equivalent um, F2.8 lens available. He's, he'd like so to think fast pass, in his 55 to 200. So I'll pass that question over to Carl because I know he used to shoot um, a lot of motorsport and what have you when he was uh, in his Nikon days, but we, we still like him even he used to use. Um, those cameras. Um, so I'll, I'll let Carl answer that one. Uh, yeah, so we do. We have the 50 to 140 f2.8, which is the 70 to 200 equivalent in our range. Uh, linear motor, so it's really fast to focus. And on something like a, an X-T3 or an X-T4 would be absolutely perfect. Uh, I used to have that lens. In fact, I've still got one from my motorsport kit, uh, along with a 24 to 70 equivalent. So our 16 to 55 f2.8 and uh, a wide lens so the 10 to 24 f4 uh, which we've just brought out a new one as well so those three in the bag if you need something longer we've got the 100 to 400 as well which is a, a 150 to 600 equivalent as well would you recommend a monopod or something with that uh well the the 100 to 400 has actually got image stabilization built in so if you're using that with something like an xt4 you're getting sort of five and a half to six stops of stabilization in the lens and the body um, so there's no need for a monopod, uh, in my experience, for that. That's not to say that they're not useful, because they definitely are. Uh, and we've seen lots of photographers use them uh, throughout the years. But for me, not really necessary because of the stabilisation in the lens and the body. Okay. 
Uh, we've got quite a detailed question here, which is um, someone would like you to go into the microphone input options for the X series, not including the Fuji mic, they said. So namely, they're talking about plug-in mics. Okay, definitely. I'm going to give that one to Carl. He's, he's, he's a <laughs> bit of our video expert. So um, yeah, Carl's a, a jack of all trade and a master of, of a lot of them, to be perfectly honest. It's unfair to say master of none. So, so I'll, I'll um, bow out on that one because as soon as it goes to moving image, I am useless. So so Carl is, is the man for that question. <laughs> Thanks, Andreas. Um, so with X-Series, we've got the uh, three and a half mil mic jack on the camera. Um, so with most mics on, on the market today, um, especially sort of uh, the more cost effective or intermediate level microphones, they'll generally have a three and a half mil jack. So they can be plugged straight into the camera, no worries. If you're using a wireless system, like lavalier mic, um, I know uh, Rode just released the wireless Go 2. So again, that's got a three and a half mil jack uh, that can be plugged straight into the camera, into all of our cameras. We've also got microphone controls for audio levels manually that you can control through that as well. Um, if you're talking about the more professional end, sort of XLR inputs and things like that, we don't have those on our cameras currently. And so do I, I understand rightly that um, all of your cameras have 3.5 mil jacks? Uh, there are so, a couple of the, the more cost effective ones that have a two and a half mil jack, sort of the XA7, XA5 and things like that. Um, but they've all got that industry standard two and a half or three and a half mil jack rather than XLR, mini XLR and things like yes. that, inputs like that. And you can get an adapter between 2.5 and 3.5. Yeah. It's usually in the box, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Hey. Fantastic. So um, looking at your lens range, um, as we said, it's it's an extensive range. What would you recommend for somebody who's thinking about setting up a nice kind of everyday shooting kit, maybe some landscape, street photography, that kind of thing? Um, well, you can't go wrong with buying absolutely every single lens just to make sure you're covered. I mean, and you, you, you know that. But <laughs> Fair point. If that's not an option. Um, the, the, the thing is, um, you, you, the previous question about the XT30 gentleman with the 18 to 55, I think that probably the, the most standout thing from our range has been that the kit lens isn't actually just a subpar um, plastic mount kit lens as, as they were historically. We were always um, in the industry, yeah, it's a kit lens, so like just use it until you get bored of it, sort of thing. So. Actually, the majority of our cameras um, come with like either an 18 to 55, which is actually a stunning lens, or um, we've introduced a 16 to 80 about 18 months ago. So we offer that as a kit variation. So for general travel, walk around, um, landscape, those two lenses are, are more than adequate for, for the majority of situations. As soon as you start going specialist and you think yourself street photography, street photography is all about being discreet being so like not seen. So you want as small as possible. Something like uh, 23 mil, which is equivalent to 35, would be um, a very, very traditional street photography lens or a 35 mil, which is equivalent to a 50. Um, but also probably the 27 mil, we've just announced a new version, which is weather resistant, would be my, my go-to um, because of how discreet it is, how small it is um, on the majority of our cameras. So. Um, it, it's all like it is horses for courses. I mean, I'm not saying you can't shoot street photography with your 18 to 55, or your 16 to 80, but you probably want to remove distractions, sort of thing. So, so the zoom is a bit of a distraction. So, the, the size of the lens is a bit of a distraction. So, so you people tend to prefer prime lenses for, for street photography, but the, the kit lenses are the ones that I would um, say are more than adequate for. The majority of photographic applications and as your photography grows and and so like you want to invest in the system we, we have the lenses to take you up so if that person just starting out then wants something for wildlife we've got a 70 to 300 or as carl said 100 to 400 depending upon their budget depending upon how big and bulky they want to make that kit so ultimately it, the, the the versatility of the range speaks for itself when it comes to actually being able to do certain uh, genres of photography. Okay. Uh, John okay. is asking about when using the X-T4 for video, is there a sub 30 minute uh, time limit? 
So video wise, the time limit on the X-T4 is a few seconds short of 30 minutes, yes. When shooting 4K 60p, obviously the time limits vary depending upon the frame rate. And if you're shooting at the super um, high speed, slow motion, the, the time limit's only like uh, three or six minutes depending upon the frame rate. But yes, there is a 30 minute upper limit on the 4K shooting 60p. If you hit that so, limit, so yeah. if you hit that limit, will it then continue on to another clip or do you have to press the button again? No, no, again no. To go to the... If you hit that limit, it basically stops recording, then you need to start recording again. Okay, that's very simple. So, and so we've obviously got our X series. And then the yep. other side of the, the uh, tail, the other side of the coin rather, is our GFX system as well. So I want to hand over to James to talk a little bit about the GFX system for those people who want um, that, that larger sensor, the ultimate in image quality. Um, we, we brought out a GFX system about four years ago now. So I'll hand over to James to discuss the, the cameras and lenses available in that range. Thank you. Um, so yes, as you said, Andreas, the, um, the GFX system was launched about four years ago. Um, and the idea of the system was to give a larger than full frame sensor. Uh, so really, really high end professional top of the range image quality, but still managed to do it in a camera that's smaller and lighter than uh, full frame cameras of the time were. So kind of, um, you know, kind of 36 megapixel, 50 megapixel uh, DSLR, something like that. So it's to give exceptional image quality in a smaller than that package if possible. Uh, the engineers worked really hard and they managed to do it. So we had the uh, GFX 50S uh, in 2017, and then that was followed by the GFX 50R. Now those were both uh, 50 megapixel uh, larger than full frame sensors. So they're 1.7 times larger than full frame. The actual dimensions of the sensor are, if you'll give me a fraction of a millimeter each way, 44 by three millimeter. So that's a 55 mil diagonal. Um, and that's also a four by three aspect ratio. So if you're doing landscapes or portraiture, you get a little bit more um, top and bottom for your uh, skies and foreground, and a little bit more on the width for when you're printing. Um, so we developed those, uh, and they were the, the two bodies. The 50S was more of an SLR style. Um, so that was perhaps if you wanted to pigeonhole it, kind of more um, studio and longer lenses, perhaps uh, for wildlife or anything. Um, and then the 50R was kind of more of a rangefinder style. So it mimics the, the X series breakdown. Um, we have like the XT and the X Pros. Um, and the 50R could be used. Um, it was very uh, small and discreet and very nicely paired with lenses like the 45mm or the 63, which were 35 and a, and a 50 effective. So really good for street photography. Um, after that came the GFX 100. Uh, that was announced at Photokina 2018, I think. Um, and that came out in 2019. Um, that was the world's first uh, 102 megapixel a uh, larger than full frame sensor with IBIS that shot 4K. That'll do 4K at 30 frames per second within body stabilization. Um, improvements that we made uh, on that, we put phase detection on it. So it was even faster than the 50S and the 50R for focusing mm -hmm. uh, and better in low light as well. Um, phase detection was improved massively. And of course, going from 50 megapixels up to 102 megapixels was a huge leap in resolution as well. Not that 50 megapixels is slumming it by any stretch. Um, so that that kind of uh, opened the horizons for for um, people who wanted to do archival work or you know, no limits on prints kind of thing. Really go really go large on those. But also as well, we worked hard to introduce pixel shift um, for uh, basically the in body stabilization unit. Will take a sequence of shots, um, so you can use it for if you're doing really high end reproduction work or archival work or anything like that where you just need uh, nothing in the frame moving, so even interiors as well, you need the absolute maximum resolution with no false color that you can possibly get. Um, the GFX 100 uh, was then um, announced that it would tether with uh, Capture One. So if you're using that in the studio, uh, it'll tether. And uh, we are one of the only other manufacturers that will tether with Capture One. Um, and then of course, recently we've just launched the GFX 100S, which hopefully uh, some of you that are watching now would have seen my talk yesterday. And the 100S um, took all the best parts of the GFX 100, so the sensor um, and the way of controlling the image quality, but we've shrunk it down. So we've managed to make the in-body stabilization unit smaller and lighter, the shutter smaller and lighter, and we've gone to the new uh, 235 battery, which is the same as in the X-T4. 
Uh, so that makes a smaller and lighter camera that's about 900 grams instead of 1500 for the GFX uh, 100. Um, still gives you outstanding image quality, um, you know, shallower depth of field compared to full frame, greater tonal range, um, really punchy colors, of course, because we are Fujifilm. And then to use that system, the lenses, uh, we have a range of lenses going from a uh, 23 mil, which will give you an 18 mil effective up to a 250 mil, which will give you 200 mil effective. Um, to work out what your focal length multiplier is, if you're shooting full frame at the moment, um, it's 0.79 times or 21% off. Or if, like me, you can't do the 1% in, in your head on the fly, then 20% off, and that'll be about right, which is, uh, so we'll start with an easy one. Uh, 250 gives you a 200 mil effective, um, give or take. Uh, we've got a range of primes and zooms as well. So if you're uh, a photographer who knows exactly what they're doing and they just want one lens or a couple of lenses for specific purposes, um, then we do the primes. But if you're a photographer that's perhaps going out there and, and seeing what the world can offer, especially with the 100S being so light and small, um, we do a 32 to 64, which is a 25 to 50, uh, 45, 100, which is a 35, 80, and a 100, 200, which is an 80 to 160. Uh, if you're doing macro, there's a 120 F4 half macro, which is a 95. There's a 1.4 teleconvertible 250. So there's a wide range of um, lenses to, to kind of suit whatever kind of photography you're looking at doing. Thanks, do James. You have the, so, uh, James, do you have the GFX 100S with you alongside the, I think you had yes. the X100V the other day, which made a very I did the impressive The X100V is just there, I'll get it. Okay. Because I think this okay. is when you hold it in front of your face, it just really brings home the the dramatic shrinkage that's gone on. Yeah, it's okay. absolutely mental, especially when you think of the <laughs> fact that the sensor in the GFX 100S is four times bigger than that. In the that the camera isn't four times bigger. It, it's like the okay. the engineers are just yeah. Yeah, I think taking the lens off really <laughs> makes the message quite clear there. Because I think, yeah. like you say, the Indeed, original but... GFX. It was an impressively small camera, like you say, compared it to full frame cameras at that time. Now everything's yes. shrunk down a bit. I think the GFX 100S is impressively small. It's such a big yeah. sensor. Yeah, it's really tiny. Well, Go on, Andrew. Everyone keeps moving the goalposts and everyone keeps challenging each other. And, and that's a great thing about this industry. I mean, um, you, you're not, you can't really blame the cameras anymore for taking a bad, bad image. Um, and, and everyone to like is, is sort of like trying to one up each, each other sort of thing. And, and, and that's, that's the thing I love most about, about the industry and, and hopefully encourages more and more people to go out and take pictures. And as you said, Ange, the, the technology is, is amazing considering where we were, as you said, just even mm. four years ago on the 50S. And we've got some more questions coming in at the moment. They're, uh, about X series. Um, that's fine. No, no, Paris... we just wanted to make sure that the people remember yeah. that we do something bigger than full frame as well. I'm sure they'll come those questions, but, uh, Harris is saying he's got an XT four and he really wants to do some wildlife photography. Would you recommend the new 70 to 300 with the 1.4 teleconverter or the 100 to 400 million? He says, which one would you buy today? So I think he's going to get his credit card out. So if he was buying one today and wanted to leave with something today, he's going to have to buy the hundred to 400. He's about a week, a uh, week or two early for the 70 to 300. The, the thing that's worth mentioning about the 70 to 300 is it's absolutely amazing considering the, the focal length and the size and weight difference. Um, in terms of uh, image quality and, and everything, again, for, for the small package, um, it is stunning. Ultimately, it comes down to compromise and photography is all about compromise. Is, does he want the smallest, lightest system possible? Yes, go for the 7300 with the 1.4 teleconverter. Does he want the best image quality and isn't willing to sacrifice anything? Then go with the 100 to 400. Um, obviously, one is about twice as expensive as the other. Um, and by no means do I think that it's twice the image quality, but it is better image quality. You'd expect that from a much bigger zoom, um, the, the 100 to 400, given it's a, a, one of our premium zoom lenses. But uh, yeah, I, I think that probably the thing to do is if you can wait a couple of weeks and, and my sales team will help hate me saying this, but both of them should be on the loan system, hopefully by the end of March, and then he can try them out for himself and say, actually, yeah, yeah I like the size and weight of that versus um, the image quality I'm getting 
on, on the other one. Yeah, because it was all about finding the right balance. And if it's it's if it's the lens that you want to take out with you and use, and you enjoy it because it's light and and, and convenient, then it probably is the much better lens for you rather than thinking, oh, oh I actually yeah. wanted something smaller. And I, I know this is brilliant quality, but if it's a bit of a barrier to taking it out, then maybe it's it, not. It the right all comes lens. down to if if wildlife is something he's getting into, uh, then I would say the seventy to three hundred is the one to go for. If wildlife is his passion and it is going to be everything he does, then the hundreds, 400 is the thing to go for. Okay, there we go. So maybe keep your credit card in your back pocket for a couple more weeks and then um, have that 48 hour loan. Um, yeah. Anthony has asked, he says he's got the XT20 um, and he's got a bit of a problem with the white balance, the auto white balance. It's producing a bit of a blue tint regardless of the other settings and he can't alter it. Do you know what he might be able to do? Is, do you think there could be a problem with it? So I'll let James handle this one because I think it's quite a common issue with, with a few people that have got a tint to their images on the white balance. It's all to do with the default custom settings of white balance. Yeah, so on, on the white balance, you can actually change um, when you go in and choose your white balance. You can also then choose the tint on it as well. Um, so it'll be worth having a look through the menus and uh, checking that that's not set. So the white balance is set to purely neutral. There's no tint on it at all. Um, of course, if, if, uh, if Anthony, I think his name was, uh, any problems on that, um, you can get in touch. You can book a one-to-one -one with us through the website. Um, and I'll happily have a chat one-on-one -on -one and see if I can help, uh, whilst he's got the camera in his hands. Um, but of course, if not pop it back through service, but it's, it's usually a settings thing. If there's a tint on there, it's quite easily done. I've done it myself. Great. So hopefully we'll get that sorted nice and quickly. Um, yeah, Linda has asked, sorry. Sorry, I was just going to say, I think it's the left on the D-pad automatic, it, it by default is set to white balance. So mm -hmm. it's very easy to nudge by, so like just, just a hand, a handful of presses that, that you, you're nudging it to, um, one of the color shifts. Right. Yeah. And if you didn't know you did it, then yeah, yeah. it's always going to be there as a problem. Uh, Linda says she's got the, uh, she's got XH1 and she's got some XF lenses, uh, and she's she'd like to get a ring flash but there isn't a fujifilm ring flash and just wonder if you've got any recommendations james do you can you think of anything carl can you think of anything <laughs> <laughs> thanks guys um right. yeah there's a there's a there's a couple of options out there um from third party manufacturers unfortunately we don't make our own ring flash um uh there is a newer there is um, Nissin, uh, I think it's the MF-16, uh, which do they do a ring flash, uh, and there are a couple of other options. Most of them are generally all manual with no automatic setting, so you have to go in and um, adjust the power of each side of the ring flash. Uh, but there are options available, just not from us, not, not our own. Thanks, Carl. Okay, uh, I think that answers uh, her husband's follow-up question, so that's great. Thank you very much for that. Um, oh, it was just a comment from Rob really he's got an X-Pro2 and his wife has an X-T3 and they've both found themselves knocking a control button without noticing the change so they're just wondering if there's any options to lock those or give yes, advice on how they do. might overcome it uh, so on the X-T3 uh, you can do um, you can individually lock out specific buttons so uh, when the camera's in live view, uh, menu, then across, then down to the um, down to the spanner or the wrench menu, then across to button dial settings, and then all the way down to uh, the lock option. It should be the last one in that list. Um, through lock, you can then choose uh, selected functions or all functions. All functions will lock out pretty much everything apart from the shutter button, um, but specific functions you can go through and change it uh, and, and change um, kind of, if for example, you're knocking um, the Q button or whatever, you can specifically lock that out. Um, for me personally, because obviously we, we demo our kit a lot, um, people who aren't used to mirrorless uh, will change the view mode button uh, when they're looking at the screen because they think it'll change it to the viewfinder. Um, so I lock out the view mode button so it can't be changed. So I, I have that. Um, I think it's been a while since I've done it in my X-Pro2. I think you can also do that on the X-Pro2. I know you can do it on the X-Pro3, uh, but you can do that and you can lock them out individually or as a whole. Great. So hopefully there's a solution there. Um, 
we have an XT3 user who's wondering if there's, well, we're basically wondering what the benefit is of upgrading to the XT4. So maybe you could just uh, reiterate the, the difference between those two cameras, please. Oh, sorry, just to add, they shoot horses and dogs and lots of action. So recently we created, a, we introduced a firmware update on the X-T3. So actually the focus speed on both cameras will be exactly the same. So there's no improvement by going from a T3 to a T4 in terms of the autofocus. What you will be getting is the change in the screen. So you go from a three-way tilt screen to a very angle articulating screen. You get um, the in-body image stabilization. You get a quieter and quicker shutter. Um, and you get the in-body image stabilization, da, da, and then you get the bigger battery as well. So it, in terms of being able to track moving subjects, focus on things, um, your, your hit rate when doing continuous shooting, that actually won't change versus from an X-T3 to an X-T4. What you will be getting is that the, the, the benefits I can think of will be the bigger battery, um, the better shutter mechanism in terms of it being quieter and actually being quicker as well. It goes up to 15 frames a second as well. And probably the in-body image stabilization if they're ever doing events uh, indoors, um, artificial lights and need to be at slightly slower um, shutter speeds and things like that, that, that will be the benefit. Um, but again, borrow one and see for yourself. Okay, good scheme. Um, William said, I don't fully understand. He says, any documentation on the X-T3's focus bracketing and the step number? So I think he's perhaps looking for something which explains it. So, yeah, James, so the, do you want to? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll chip on that. So um, on the focus bracketing on the X-T3 with the step number, um, it, it's done as a percentage of your depth of field at a set aperture. So um, if, for example, we'll just take an aperture F8, um, if you're shooting uh, on the steps where it'll say number of frames in the step, if you go to um, plus one, that's 120% of your depth of field. Uh, the um, plus two is 140, plus three is 160, and equally the other way. So um, minus one is 80%, minus two is 60%, and so on and so forth. Um, so it'll be a little bit of practice and working out exactly how much depth of field you're using um, to make sure that you're uh, or how much depth of field is acceptably sharp to you, then working out the distance that that covers, and then you can work out from there the amount that your lens will have to shift as a percentage of the depth of field, and then work out the frames from there. Um, so that that's but again, uh, any further questions on that because that can be that's an involved subject. Um, go on our web for one to one, and I'll I'll happily help out. And I think I think the issue is with the with the Japanese to English translation in terms of step. What with what step should say is increment. So so because it's a um, because the system doesn't know until you set the aperture, your distance to the subject, it doesn't know what that depth of field is. So by by having that step in there, it, 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 you're having to manually say, I want an extra twenty percent, thirty, forty percent, sixty percent of depth of field every single time you take a photo. Yeah, right. But you can do okay. it with the. Um... Uh, with the uh, focus peaking as well, if you stop down the lens with focus peaking, you'll also see just how much depth of field you've got uh, at a certain distance at a certain aperture as well. So you can you can work it out from there too. Good tip. Uh, Dina says she is new to photography and she has an XT two hundred with the fifteen to forty five mil lens. Um, what would you suggest as a next option? She loves doing macro but also wildlife. Carl, what would you suggest? Macro and wildlife. Macro, um, if you don't want to outlay too much on a brand new lens or anything like that, the extension tubes are a really, really good option. Uh, we do two for the X-Series, we do an 11mm and a 16mm, uh, and they'll attach to your current lens, be able to get you to focus a lot closer than you currently would. So that's a great way to get involved and get started. Uh, if you're really into macro, then we have the 60mm f2.4 lens, which is one of our older lenses. Still a great lens. Uh, it's been there since day dot, really. Uh, and then if you'll get really, really, really involved, we've obviously got the 80mm one-to-one full macro. For wildlife, um, we've got the 55 to 230 We've got the 55 to 200 
the 70 to 300 and the 100 to 400 so there are lots of options available uh, if i was just starting out i'd probably go for the 55 to 200 it's the best blend of optical quality price size weight and uh, all round goodness <laughs> and with with your extension tubes do you get full you know is the full electrical contact so you still get autofocus and exposure control yeah with our xf lenses they read read the lens they've got the chips in uh, so they'll read your exposure information they'll know what aperture you're set at and be able to give you autofocus as well fantastic it's worth okay. pointing out that with the extension tubes your fo focus probably slows down a lot um it, it does take a lot of getting used to and it's probably easier to to actually manually move back and forth to find out where that limit is um be because it changes that close focusing um on that but yeah for macro something like the extension tube and even um the 70 to 300 has got a very very good close focus as well so it might be something that, that would be worth a look at, even though it is probably a more expensive lens um, than the original XT200 and 15 to 45 lens is, it would probably do a, a bit of both. It, it would definitely do the wildlife, but it also might do be good enough for the macro as well. Yeah, worth finding out, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, Right. Oh, we've got an um, XT3 user who mainly shoots landscapes. Would you recommend a prime lens or the 10 to 24 mil zoom? Ooh. The Tough thing one. is, and you, you can, well, the thing is you, you, you're going to get three different answers now. <laughs> I reckon. Are we both? Uh, yeah. Personally. I will always probably go for a 16 mil prime. Mm -hmm. um, I have traditionally gone for the 16 mil prime. If we had, uh, and then so I, I'll, I'll hand over and then the, the, the guys will probably say I'm wrong and, and suggest something else. <laughs> <laughs> go on then, um, James, what would your call be? Uh, I'm also a big fan of the 16 mil. Um, I've always used the 1.4. Of course, the new 2.8 is even smaller and lighter to carry when I'm hiking out somewhere to use it. Um, the 10 to 24 is a stunning lens. Uh, it's nice and flexible as well, so I'd use it for that. But of course, there's also the 8 to 16 2.8, uh, which is a 12 to 24. Um, that That's just a beast of a lens. It's wonderfully sharp everywhere, as they all are. But really, at 8 mil, that's a very difficult thing to do. Um, mm. it's a 2.8, uh, so it's letting a lot of light in if I'm doing any dawn or dusk work. Um, and it, of course, being a zoom, it's more, more flexible unless I need that kind of width. I will tend to favor a prime personally, unless I don't know what I'm kind of walking into. So if I'm going out to wreck your scene, it will be a 10 to 24, but, um, 16 is nice. You've got the 14 as well, but it, for me, it would be the 16, uh, the 10 to 24 or the eight to 16 to eight. So, so there that, isn't a, a, a definitive, yeah. Carl, go on, be the decider. <laughs> uh, I would take the 10 to 24 F4, the new version, every day of the week and twice on a Sunday. It is a fantastic lens. It's small, it's mm -hmm. lightweight, you can put filters on it. It's not a, um, you don't have to adapt your filter system if you're already shooting landscapes already. Um, it's very versatile. I've used it for video, I've used it for landscapes, I've used it for blogging i've used it for vlogging um that coupled with a 16 to 80 f4 and the new 70 to 300 is probably going to be my sort of go-to travel landscape kit definitely yeah. okay so split decision but i think it for me i think it came down to the 10 24 there yeah the 10 24 is the other is two are hedging the bets go -to landscape lens. Yeah. yeah okay right sorry hang on just Moving the wrong mouse. Um, Jenny has just changed from a Nikon D7500 to a Fuji X-S10 with the 16 to 80 mil lens. Uh, which other lens would you suggest to take uh, for wildlife and macro, preferably lightweight? So it's a similar question to we had before, really, where you yeah, spoke about the 60 mil. Definitely. It's, it's going to be the 70 to 300. Um, it's got a, it's got a really crazy close focusing of like, um, I think it's 80 centimeters for a length for a telephoto lens of that kind. 
Um, it, it's unheard of to, to focus that close. And obviously it's it's equivalent to 100 to, to 450. So for macro, for um, wildlife as well, it's, it's gonna be great. And if you do find yourself actually thinking, I want something a uh, bit more reach, you've got the ability to add to the teleconverters as well. So that that would be the, the must second lens for, for anyone with an XS10 and the 16 to 80. Oh, no, this is a good one. Which of your 50 and 56 mil lenses do you recommend for optimal, optimal image quality wide open? All of them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and how wide do you want to go? <laughs> James, what do, what do you think? Well, if you're, it depends on your criteria. I mean, they're all really sharp, obviously. That, that's a given. Um, and for portraiture, they're all lovely. Um, the 50 mil f1 will give the nicest bokeh and the shallowest depth of field um, so if that's what you're going for or if you're shooting extremely low light uh, then the 50 mil f1 is is the way to travel um, between the 56s we do two so we do the 56 1.2 and the 56 1.2 apd now the apd version has got an appetization filter in it which uh, really boiling it down is essentially like a, an nd filter that only works around the edge of the image um, and that will knock out, um, that will make the bocker even smoother as well. Um, so it kind of bridges the gap between the 56 1.2 and the 50 mil F1. The downside of doing that is that because it's darker at the edges and lighter in the center, you do lose a little bit of light. So um, at 1.2, for example, it's got a physical aperture of 1.2, but it's transmitting light at 1.7. Once you're past 5.6, that disappears because the aperture blades stop down past the filter. Um, so it depends on what your priorities are for that as well. If you're looking for um, the maximum light available, and also to be fair, the standard 56 is a little bit cheaper, go for that. It's a wonderful lens. Uh, I very much like yeah. it. For me, if I'm using the 56s, I will use the APD because I can see the difference, um, but the loss of light uh, when it's wide open and also the cost is a factor. But then if, if you just want the kind of the, the best of the best for portraits and really shallow depth of field, it would be the 50 mil f1 I, i've been using it a lot and i love it it's a great lens it is beautiful okay we've just got a few minutes left so i would like to try and squeeze in another couple of questions if we can martin says is he right in thinking that if he switches from his xe3 to the new xe4 he won't be able to use his current 27 mil pancake lens as it doesn't have an aperture ring and the xe4 doesn't have the necessary front dial no, he'll still be able to use his 27 mil. Yeah. Yep. I change it through the okay. command dials. Okay. And there's someone was asking about the difference, if there's an image quality difference between the XF and the XC lenses. So you're getting a, a few differences. You're getting the, the actual physical construction of the lens itself. You won't get weather resistant XC lenses. You won't, um, it, it's got a plastic mount. So, so the durability, the sort of like the overall build quality isn't as good. Um, you're not going to get an aperture ring on the uh, XC lens either. Optically, um, you'll see probably hundreds of people say that the 50 to 230 is optically as good as the 55 to 200. Um, likewise, the 16 to 50 was probably optically as good as the um, 18 to 55. You're probably just not going to get as um, uh, you're not going to get as wide an aperture sort of thing. Um, so, in terms of the lens overall construction build quality durability things like that then no that they're, they're, they're sort of like night and day um but in terms of actual optical image quality um that they're, they're going to be very very similar um but yeah okay simon is trying to decide between the xt4 and the xs10 and he's saying basically he's trying to take into account how important weather sealing is could the XS10 stand up to a little light rain or is uh, or accidental exposure to blowing sand? Or is that going to be, you know, uh, is basically XT4 going to be a better choice in light rain? Well, as soon as you start suggesting any sort of sand, weather, anything like that, you, you need to be looking at a weather resistant um, body. 
Um, I, I wouldn't want to risk any sort of, especially sand. Sand is the, the camera killer uh, of all mm. camera killers. And, and I wouldn't want it to be so like a, an XS10 and so like a sandstorm or anything like that. I mean, it, it's one of those things where we're, what do you classify as a rain shower and, and things like that? But and any sort of weather resistance uh, requirements, you, you, you're automatically in XT3, XT4, XPro3 territory. Um, it, it's, it's just a non-starter. Okay. I think Carl's and got his I talk think... about the X. I was going to say, I think Carl's got his talk about the XT4 later today, so it might be worth tuning in for that. Okay. Uh, possibly the final question, Greg Ward is asking, what are the likely delivery dates of the GFX 100S? So, depending upon if he had already placed an order, the first customers received them on Thursday. So, from now, uh, it's anybody's guess, um, really, but, but we're, we're anticipating, depending upon when their back orders were placed, it could be anything from so like a month to two to three months um, for people to get their stock. Uh, ultimately, it all comes down to supply and demand. Um, and mm -hmm. it's impossible for anyone to guess what the demand will be um, prior to a camera's launch. And, and if you build too many, you're then stuck with, with too many. If you don't build enough, then you've got quite a lot of uh, customers who, who aren't happy. But um, the, the first deliveries of GFX 100S went out on Thursday. Exciting times for some people then. So, uh, so basically, if he places an order today, he's probably looking at a month to two months, something like that. Yeah, I'd, I'd expect so, like, uh, yeah, uh, about that. Okay, so we're out of time now, so we probably need to wrap up. Um, thanks very much for joining me. It's been fantastic. Uh, hearing what you've got to say. And I think we've, we've managed to answer quite a lot of questions today. So well done. Thanks, Ange, for uh, <laughs> steering up through all the questions and what have you. Um, but, but yeah, it's always worth reiterating for people that uh, we do in the UK have this loan service available. So somebody can buy, somebody can try something before they, without any risk and that, without any obligation. So fujifilm-loan.com. Um, unfortunately, we can't have absolutely everything available um at all time but uh yeah we've got the majority of lenses majority of cameras even got the gfx range as well for people wanting to uh tempted to uh think of the, the high resolution stuff as well brilliant okay right well thanks very much everybody bye cool thanks Ange. bye bye